Uh, the data set that they will use today is a well-known data set from uh, the Surat tutorials, which the PBMC data set with three K cells. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so you will be able also to to see this data set and download it if you need. Okay, so let's start with the presentation. Um, so as I said, ASAP, so it's an automated single cell analysis portal. Uh, the goal is really to do the whole analysis online using the web the web tool. Um, so so first, before I start introducing ASAP, maybe I should start introducing the single cell field in general. Um, and I actually like this this picture because it's a good good recapitulation of what is single cell analysis. Most of you know already, but like to, to summarize. Uh, so up until now, we had like two main way of doing RNA-seq. So you can do a bulk RNA-seq analysis in a position with single cell. So in general, bulk RNA-seq analysis is um, to take a bunch of cells and then you lyse them all, and then you get uh, average expression for all the genes of, of the cells. Uh, so that was what was done in, in the past and it's still actually done. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, it works very well. Uh, the, there is a very good sensitivity, so you detect very low express genes. However, you get usually like a, an average of expression for all the genes. Uh, and if you want to do stuff like uh, find some population of cells in, in your data set, then of course you are very, very limited by this technology. Um, reversely, if you use uh, single cell data, so you really can get the transcriptome information uh, at a single cell level, so for every cell you get RNA uh, information, mm -hmm. and this is for transcriptomics. But single cell field is big, and actually you can you can do also proteomics at the single cell level. You can do whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, uh, and epigenomics data. So you can get uh, now you can even get uh, ataxic and RNA seq data from the same cell, um, which is called multiomics. Uh, and more recently, we also have like spatial transcriptomics which I still put it in single cell, but it's not really single cell because then uh, you get a, a, a spot and in a spot you can have actually multiple cells, but it's still something that is growing a lot uh, and that people usually use uh, together with a single cell methodology like a UMAP and stuff like that. So it's still something that is very, very uh, big today. Uh, but today I will mostly speak about uh, single cell transcriptomics, so not the other ones, because ASAP is mainly uh, meant to be used for single cell transcriptomics data. Uh, even though you can do also bulk transcriptomics with ASAP, so you can choose when you submit your data to do bulk or single cell. Uh, but the, the main topic of today is really single cell transcriptomics, so I will focus mostly on, on this part. Uh, different type of application of single cell, uh, of course, cancer, uh, but also development and uh, microbiology, neurobiology, et cetera, et cetera. So you name it. Uh, it's a field that is really exploding since uh, since it was first released, I think, uh, around 2015. Uh, at least the first really uh, uh, usable uh, uh, pipelines. Uh, then it really exploded. And nowadays, we, uh, we reach really uh, thousands of publications uh, every year. Um, so it's really something that is kind of trendy. Um, most of the application uh, nowadays that I saw were on atlases. So people like to create this kind of atlases. So the human cell atlas, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, the fly cell atlas that we participated in, uh, but others like the worm cell atlas and, uh, and some specific other uh, cell atlas. So that's really a, some kind of trend to try to create this huge cell atlases of many, many tissues and many, many organs. Um, so that's uh, something that is still on, on, ongoing, actually. Um, and I wanted to speak more specifically about the fly cell atlas. Uh, first, because we were part of it. So uh, ASAP uh, was used uh, when we created the cell atlas to, to actually annotate all the cell types. Uh, so we, we really... Uh, it, it took really a long time to annotate all the cell types because usually, I don't know if you know, but the, the annotation part where you really try to annotate your clusters is really the longest part when you do any single cell analysis pipeline. It takes really a lot of time. And here we, we collaborated with many, many groups and it took something like six months, I think, to annotate all the different tissues. 
so that was really a heavy uh, workload. But ASAP and Scope as well, the, the, both of the tools really helped a lot to decipher the different uh, the different clusters and the different uh, marker genes to to be able to annotate most of the most of the cell type. So I'm speaking about this one specifically because actually the data set that you will have next week for the Hanson is actually a data set that is coming from the fly cell lab. So that's on what you will work. So I know it's not human, it's not mouse, it's prosophila data. Uh, I, I guess it was a good a good thing. So, so maybe none of you all worked with prosophila already. So it's a kind of new thing. So then you can see the power of ASAP and, and how you can actually do this analysis pretty straight, straightforwardly. OK. Um, one little point about the, the different protocols that exist to the single cell. You probably know about uh, 10x, which is the most used one, I would say, uh, nowadays. Uh, but there are other ones, many other ones, actually. The two main ones are probably uh, 10x and SmartSeq. Um, usually, what people do is they, they run 10x if they really want to get lots of cells. But the sensitivity of 10x is lower, so you get less of the, of the expressed genes. Uh, and if you use SmartSeq, on the other hand, usually you get less cells, uh, but uh, with a much better sensitivity. So most of the uh, genes are actually detected. That's what you see here. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess it's important to know at least the two main technologies, because if you want to do single cell, they, uh, single cell then of course you need to use the main technologies. And currently what we use, at least in, in the lab here, is the next technology, which works uh, pretty well. Okay, uh, so yeah, so that was the global introduction about single cell. Now I will dig a little more into like the bioinformatics part of it. Um, so usually something we saw actually even in the lab when we started to do single cell, it was in 2015 or 16. Uh, so we, finally, after I don't know, one or two years of, of library preparation and, and dissections and stuff like that, then you get your single cell data. So that's cool, that works. And then suddenly you want to do the analysis yourself, and then it becomes uh, a nightmare. So it, the field evolved a lot uh, from when we, when we started back in 2016. It was really hard to do a proper single cell analysis. Uh, nowadays, it's easier because nowadays you can use uh, dedicated pipelines such, a, such as Surat or, or ScanPy. Uh, but there are still some people that are not very, very familiar with R or with Python. And then it, it can be difficult, actually, when you don't have this, like, bioinformatics background to do the analysis by yourself. Uh, so that's a typical bottleneck. And we actually experienced this in the lab as well, where uh, some, some biologists were acquiring data, but they actually didn't know how to do the analysis themselves. Um, and that's actually the original point why we developed ASAP internally. Uh, and then afterwards, we made it public uh, because we thought it would be a good, good help for people uh, that are actually not bioinformaticians. Um, so, so the analysis pipeline, the traditional single cell analysis, RNA seq analysis pipeline, can be divided in two main steps. So, you, the first step is what we call the pre-processing, uh, where you get your FASTQ files, and then you need to align your FASTQ files to a reference genome, like human or mouse reference genome, and then you need to demultiplex to find back your 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 barcodes, so your cells. Um, and then finally do some QC to generate your final uh, UMI or uh, row count matrix. And this usually is done in, in Bash, so in Unix. Uh, so you don't need R or Python to do that. Uh, it can be handled almost automatically if you use a tool like CellRanger, if your data is coming from 10x. Uh, so CellRanger will take care of all the steps automatically, and then it will generate automatically the, the row count matrix. Uh, it can also be done with other tools like Star Solo. It's a bit more tedious to do because then you need to parameterize a little bit the, the different things, but it, it works well as well. Um, and then, the, the so basically, the input of this pre-processing step, the FASTQ files, and the output is the count matrix. So that's what I call the pre-processing. Uh, so usually, for example, if you run Serranger, uh, then you will get something like that. So it's like a QC that you get. Uh, with the estimated number of cells and average number of reads per cell, and also like this kind of curve here where you see the, the cells that are detected compared to the empty cells or the empty barcodes where you really don't have enough UMI to call to be able to call them uh, cells. Uh, 
Uh, and you have other stuff that I will not enter into the details because that's not the topic today. But uh, yeah, usually you get these kind of things. And then when you're done, the, so you have your count matrix. And now you need to do the proper analysis that I call the downstream analysis. Uh, and there it's when you need to go to Python or to R uh, to actually analyze the data. So first you, you load the data in, in, the, uh, in the environment, and then you need to run the actual processing pipeline. Uh, like normalization, filtering, and UMAP, PCA, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where ASAP is actually used. So uh, with ASAP, you cannot do the pre-processing part. Uh, in input, you need the uh, you need the count matrix. Um, but it, from the count matrix, then you can do all the different steps, uh, but it cannot process FASTQ files. Uh, the main reason is it's a web tool. So uploading FASTQ files would be actually too heavy to, to handle by the by the web uh, tool, so we 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 decided to start from the count matrix, which is much easier. Uh, the the other reason is that usually the pre-processing pipeline is very very straightforward, one, so you don't really need to tune some parameters or to come back or to redo something. Usually, you just process it with the default parameters and it generates your raw count data, and, and that's it. Um, that there, there are some exceptions, of course, it's not completely true. Uh, sometimes you need to, to tune a little bit the, the, the threshold to find your empty cells versus your non-empty cells. Uh, but usually it's pretty straightforward. So we decided to start with uh, the, the end of this pipeline, which is the, the count matrix. Okay. Um, so one question that you may ask uh, that was asked before was, can't I use a black box pipeline? So why do I need a Surat or ScanPy or ASAP? Uh, ca cannot I just run a default script to, to do everything for me? And then that's it. Um, that could be, so this kind of things is okay for the pre-processing, as I said before, because it's very, very streamlined and very, very straightforward. But usually it's insufficient for downstream analysis uh, because it's very rare that you actually go straight from, from the, the count data to your annotation. And it's very common that you actually circle back and you need to redo the clustering with different parameters or you need to redo the uh, the filtering with different parameters as well because you identify the outlier cell population. Uh, so it's much more complicated. So it is possible, for example, in Cell Ranger um, to, to do like an automated downstream analysis pipeline and then you can visualize it using this loop tool that is present for 10x. Uh, but it's limited, of course, because then you cannot reprocess anything. So everything is fixed, and then you need to work with what, what is generated. Um, so yeah, so, so that's why there are some other tools that exist. And I don't think that many, many people are actually using this loop visualization thing. Uh, usually, uh, by informaticians uh, are, are using uh, other solutions. Uh, I told about them already, like Surat or ScanPy. So Surat is R-based and ScanPy is Python-based. So depending on the language you use, so you will prefer using Surat or you will prefer using ScanPy. But basically, the, the, the analysis pipeline for both of the frameworks is basically the same. So the steps are the same, the, the, the architecture, the, everything is the same. So of course, the limitation is that it requires R and Python skills, uh, so it takes time to, to implement thoroughly. Um, and then that's why people can can actually prefer like user-friendly automated analysis portals like ASAP or others that are, so Fast Genomics is another one, but you, you need to pay for it, so it's commercially available. Uh, ASAP is free of use. Um, and th these, these portals are nice because you, you don't need to code anything. Uh, it's very fast to obtain results, so basically you just click buttons and then it, it progresses into the pipeline. Uh, it's interactive as well, so you can select some cells, you can visualize some, some, some plots, you can, you can interact with most of the plots. Uh, and also it's reproducible, uh, which is very nice in, in nowadays that people try to do really fair standards. Uh, so uh, this reproducible, interoperable standards. Uh, so in ASAP, which is nice, is that you see your pipeline, everything is stored in a Docker environment, so it's completely reproducible, and uh, you can rerun it, uh, and you will get the exact same result. Um, so as I said, there's two main pipelines, Surat in R and ScanPy. Uh, Surat is now in version 5, uh, from recent, actually. 
Uh, and that's actually the version we have in, in ASAP. In ASAP, the pipeline we are currently using uh, is Surat. Uh, we we had we had some scripts in ScanPy, but we didn't update them. So we we for now they are marked as obsolete, so you cannot use them anymore. Uh, but we will add the new ones soon. Uh, but currently, yeah, the whole pipeline is designed based on the Surat uh, pipeline. Uh, so the downstream analysis, typical downstream analysis when you do single cell analytic data. So those are the different steps that usually you run. So first you start with a QC cell filtering, uh, where you try to identify cells that are outliers uh, because, for example, they have too many mitochondrial reads or they have too low UMI, uh, and then you remove them from the data because they can actually pollute uh, your, your PCA or your UMAP afterwards. Uh, then you normalize your data to remove the depth uh, bias uh, because, every, of course, every of the cells have different counts of UMI, so you need to normalize for this. Uh, then you try to identify the highly viable genes, HVG, uh, which are the, the, the viable features in your data, so you have tools also to do that. Um, then you scale your data. Uh, you can remove some covariates. So if you have some known covariates like batch uh, effect, or if you have like you want to remove, for example, the mitochondrial uh, content, or you want to remove the uh, the depth uh, impact of your of your signal, then you can do it also at the scaling step. Then you run a, a traditional PCA. So I guess all of you know what is a PCA. Uh, where you can start visualizing your data, uh, but usually the PCA for single cell analysis is not meant for visualization purpose. It's mostly meant as like a, a reduction dimension technique, dimension reduction technique uh, that is afterwards used to, to build a UMAP. So the UMAP is not built on the row count or the normalized count matrix. Usually the UMAP you compute based on the PCA and similarly for the TCD and for the clustering. So they all come from the PCA results. Um, and usually the UMAP and the TCD are the visualization methods. So that's what you use to visualize your data in, in a better way. And you will see directly, even with very, very simple data, that the UMAP and the TCD visualization are much, much better than the, the PCA visualization. Uh, you see much better your different clusters. It separates the cluster better, basically. And then based on the clustering, then the goal is to annotate your clusters. Uh, uh, usually what you try to annotate are like, um, are like cell types uh, that you can find in some tissue and or some cell lines that you are studying. Uh, so the way to do that is to find the marker genes of each of your cluster. So what genes are differentially expressed, are like high, higherly expressed in this cluster compared to all the other ones. Those are called the marker genes. Um, and once you have the marker genes, then uh, you can use this information to, to annotate your cell types. If you know, of course, in advance that this marker genes is very specific for this kind of cell type. So you have some data set or database available online where you, you have this uh, marker genes per cell type, uh, like uh, um, uh, mapping, and then you can use this actually to annotate your, your clusters. So that's a traditional pipeline. And that you can do with Surat, ScanPy, and you can also do everything uh, with ASAP completely online. But that's a pretty pipeline. And that's, if, if this would be like that, then you could actually use uh, a standard, uh, like non, uh, straightforward uh, analysis, black box kind of analysis. But usually it's more complicated than that. And usually when you, you start to annotate your clusters, then you will realize that some clusters maybe uh, are not correctly done, so you need to increase the number of clusters or you need to re reduce the number of clusters. So you go back to the clustering and you go back to the marketing again and again, so you're back and forth. So that's usually what, what you cannot do with black box pipelines like this loop uh, thing. Um, and, it, and this is actually even the easy way because usually it's much more complex than that. And you, you have some examples of data sets where uh, you realize that actually the clustering is not good, so you need to go back to the PCA to increase the number of principal components or reduce it uh, to try to see if you can get a better UMAP. Uh, or sometimes you, you identify in the UMAP like a cluster of very, very weird population that is probably just like outliers because of technical artifacts like mitochondrial content and stuff like that. And then you realize that actually these cells are not good and then you need to refilter them. Them out. So actually, you go back to the self filtering step and you start again. 
Um, so that's why I, I think it's it's uh, interesting to have um, a very modular framework where you can go back in your pipeline and change some parameters and then see what it changes. And then, it, of course, it's very convenient with ASAP because everything is online. So you just press buttons, you realize that something is wrong. So you go back to the step, you change the parameters, and then you, you don't have to run scripts or to rerun anything. Uh, so it's uh, it's pretty straightforward, I would say, to do with, with ASAP. OK, voila. Uh, I'm done with the global introduction. Um, so now my, my goal is to do, what time is it? So my goal now is to do um, a more uh, demo, a live demo using ASAP. Uh, so maybe before I, I continue, uh, is there any questions? Ah, I see that. Ah, Fabrice, you already answered. So someone's answered is it ask is is it possible to integrate any different more questions? Single cell RNAs. There's a question about sets. integration. Uh yeah. It is currently not possible to integrate different data sets on ASAP. Um that's something that we, we plan to do, uh, but it's not yet available. So it's something that will be available uh probably by beginning of next year. That's something that we are currently implementing. Any more questions? No. Okay. Uh, so now we'll continue with ASAP. Uh, ah, yeah, there is one question. What is this I'm dealing with non annotated transcripts? Um, uh, so, so, so basically, in ASAP, when you upload your data, uh, we we have a um, we have a, a script that runs that tries to map all the genes in your data to the ensemble database. Uh, so those those databases are then annotated to like uh, gene ontology ter uh, terms, and then uh, other types of ontologies like uh, cell cell types and stuff like that. Um, if they are non annotated, they they are kept in the data sets, of course. You can still visualize the expression and everything, but um, but that's it. So that's uh, that's not more than that. So you you will not find them, or you not, will not be able to use them for enrichment in a gene ontology and, and other ontologies or cell types. But they are kept, so you don't lose them. Is it then possible to upload integrated as or anything into ASAP? So you can, yeah. So so ASAP. So now actually ASAP. There are two ways of using ASAP. So whether you can use it from scratch to so upload your raw count data and then you do the whole analysis online on ASAP, and then you can you can have afterwards you can recuperate the data as a loom or as, as a H five AD file, and then we continue the analysis on, by yourself. So that's one way to use it, and the other way to use it is actually to upload an already um, existing H5AD or Loom5 containing all your analysis, and it will be automatically uh, uh, displayed, basically, so you will be able to display all your UMAP and TISNI and clustering and stuff on, on ASAP directly, uh, and then it can be used only for visualization. Uh, so that's the second usage, I would say, of, of ASAP. So you can, uh, so if you have already integrated data, uh, then you can you can upload it on ASAP and then it will display on the website and then you will be even able to uh, do extra analysis from the portal. Uh, Loom H5 AD is, is different formats. Uh, so when you store single cell RNA-seq data, you have many, many formats that exist. The first one is just a text count matrix uh, in a text format. But you can also store it as a Surat object or ScanPy object. And usually ScanPy creates an H5 AD file. Uh, so that's the default format for, for, for ScanPy. Um, and it becomes actually the common format, I would say, to store single cell data. Uh, but there are others. And the one we use actually internally within ASAP is uh, Loom. So everything is is there to using Loom files within ASAP, but afterwards you can export it as a as an H5AD or Loom file or other format. 
So yeah, the the in the input file can be basically anything. So HIV, Loom, uh, text file, whatever. Uh, and the output file is whether Loom or HIV. And then when you have this this output, so here I will use I will open ASAP. Uh, um, we have a tutorial actually that says how to um, how to work with Loom files that are created with ASAP. So if you want to to use it afterwards, so it explains what is a Loom file. And then it, it gives also a few code here. Uh, this is in R or in Python here, where you can actually uh, import this Loom file within an R or a Python environment. Does it answer your questions? Yeah, I see no other questions, so I will probably continue. Yeah, yeah, there is a Luma package from Satija, yeah. Uh, it's quite old, I, I think, but it's, it still works uh, pretty well. Um, so yeah, that's one way to do. Okay, um, so now I will switch to, to, to ASAP. Uh, so it creates a, a live demo. I hope it works. <laughs> it's always with live demo, you know, always have something that I didn't think about and then it crashed. Um, so yeah, so here is a main portal for ASAP. So the the the, the URL is asap.pfl.ch, uh, and my goal, at least for the course today, is to reproduce the analysis that we have with Sir, in Surat. So here is a like the PBMC tutorial. So I can I can give it the link to you, but maybe you know it already. Um, so this is a, the main tutorial where you want to use uh, Surat. Uh, so you have the data here. So you can download it. It's a tar GZ file, uh, which is actually stored as a as a text file. Uh, just it's GZ. Um, and and so here you have the tutorial that explains all the steps that you can do if you use Serrat. So all the comments that you need to run and all the plots that you get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And my goal today is to show you that we can actually reproduce this with ASAP in a very very convenient way. So that's what I will do in, in just a moment. Uh, but first, I, I want to, to present you the, the portal and how, how it works and how to use it. Uh, so when you connect to ASAP, asap.epfl.th, then you get to this main page where you see all the, the public projects that are here that get a, a permanent public key, uh, which is usually used by people. For example, if you want to give um, to, to put it in a, a publication, then it's a, a permanent URL. So you can like, give the link and then people from the publication can access directly your data. Um, you you can also log in. It's not mandatory, but that's something you can do. You can register and then you can log in afterwards. Um, if you don't log in, then it still works. So we create what we call a sandbox project, which is, uh, which is basically the same as a normal project that you would do if you are logged in, except that it's destroyed after, I think it's 24 hours or something like that. Uh, so after a, a certain period of time, it's destroyed. And of course, if you disconnect from the page and then you come back like, uh, I don't know, eight hours later, then, then of course you will not be able to find back your data. So it's just to test the pipeline if you don't want to register. Uh, it's still possible to do it without registering. Um, as a sandbox project. But of course, if you want to keep track of your projects and you want to keep them for later, or if you want to share them with some of your of your collaborators, then you need to register to be able to keep everything uh, in your in your session. Okay, uh, so as I showed before there, we have many tutorials that you can access from here. Um, we also have two main atlases that are available directly within ASAP, so the fly cell atlas data and the human cell atlas data. So in the fly cell atlas page, so you see here uh, all the different projects that, that exist and uh, you can access them from here or you can download the raw data. Uh, so you see all the tissues, the technology that was used because uh, in the fly cell atlas, we use both the 10X and the SmartSeq2 technologies. You can see all of that and you can access the project by clicking the view button. Um, or you can uh, access already uh, already existing public data. I will try with the first one, maybe. Um, so of course, it's public data. So as you can see, it, you can only view it in, in read-only read -only mode. So since it's public, you will not be able to 
make any modification or to run new analysis on it. If you want to do this, then you, you can, you just need to clone it. Uh, so if you clone the project, uh, then it will create a perfect copy of the existing project and then you will it will be in your session. So then you will be able to actually modify it and annotate it or whatever uh, you want to do. So let's click on the first one and then we'll see uh, we'll see what is what is this pancreas data from mouse. There's 9,000 cells and 55,000 genes, apparently. But it was published recently. And it was done with the V6 version of ASAP. Uh, the last one, as you may have seen, is the uh, V7, uh, which is very, very recent because it was published like a few days ago, I think. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's something I didn't show. But basically, um, for each of the release of ASAP, so we create a separate Docker, so it's completely version. Um, and basically, you see all the different packages that we use with their versions. So here you have the, the R version that is used, the Python version that is used, and all the different packages with their version. Uh, so everything is 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 really make made to be reproducible fully. So you really have all the information about the uh, the different packages that are used in in a specific version. Uh, but this project apparently was done with version number six. Um, and here, when you open the project, so here it's an already run project, so it's a public project, uh, you see many things. So you see on the front page, first you see what analysis were done. So you see here the um, the uh, the pipeline that was run, so parsing, QC, uh, uh, then they use the practice Surat pipeline, uh, and then Rima here, and all the DE that was run. So here you have like an arborescence or a tree showing everything that was uh, that was run. Um, you also see here the number of, of steps that were run for each, uh, the number of tools that were run for each of the steps. And you can also put some uh, extra external link to your project. So here, apparently, the author that published this project, they, um, they actually linked with a geo dataset. So here you can click on it, and then you can access the GSC data if you want to really reproduce everything from the FASCU files. So you can create this kind of links. And then uh, if you go to the different steps, so then you see how the steps were done. So that's why I said it was fully reproducible because here you see everything that was run by the authors. You see the parameters that we use. So for the set filtering, you see all the parameters that they use uh, similarly for normalization and provide removal and et cetera. And if you click on visualization, then you see the uh, actual uh, plots. So like the UMAP or the, the PCA. So here, apparently, they run two UMAP, a 2D and a 3D one. Uh, and here you see the, the, the different uh, cells on this UMAP. And if you go to the coloring, so controls, here you can also display the um, clustering that they run. Apparently, they run, they run a clustering here. Um, and you see the cluster that they chose to, to keep in their data set with the different uh, uh, cell populations. Ah, and that's nice. Actually, they annotated some of the clusters. You see, the, the cluster number two was annotated as beta cells, and cluster number three was also annotated as beta cells. So if I select only cluster three, that's this cluster here. So this one was annotated as a beta cluster. Uh, and cluster six, apparently, was annotated as the alpha cells, and cluster 11 was annotated as delta cells, et cetera, et cetera. So they apparently did not annotate all the clusters, but at least some of them were annotated by the uh, authors, so that you can find also on uh, on on here. Okay, so that's basically how it works when you when you when you have public datasets. But what we are interested in also today is how to do an analysis from scratch. Uh, so I will first log in. Yeah, that's me. And when you log in, you have a slightly different view. Uh, so first, you have your, still the public project, but you also have your own projects. So here you see all the projects that I've created. Uh, and I can still clone some projects if I, want, if I want to create copies of some projects to maybe modify some parameters, but keep the original project. Um, and you can share projects as well with other users. So here, this one was shared with two other users. Uh, that's pretty convenient, actually. Uh, as a bioinformatician, usually that's what I do. So I. I have data that was sent by collaborators. I run the analysis, whether on Surat, and then I put it on ASAP or directly on ASAP. And then I, I share it with like the biologists or like the, the tissue experts. 
that will do the annotation and then they have access to everything and then they can annotate and they can work on the same project that I created. But a nice feature also that you can uh, have on, on some of your projects to share it with uh, collaborators. Okay, but now I will, I will create a new project. Uh, so I click this new project button on the top uh, and here, so, so that's where you need to submit your count metrics from your pre-processing pipeline that I spoke about before. Um, so there's many ways to do that. Um, so you can browse the, your, your computer. You can even copy a URL that exists. Uh, so here I have some files. Uh, let me check. Um, yeah, I have like a CSV. So I will just show you how it works with different types of, of files. So here, if I upload the CSV file, uh, then you see a, a pre-processing that is run. And here you have normally here, you have an extract of the, the matrix that is displayed, but here you see it's not working um, because the delimiter here shows this tabulation. So here I need to select comma. And then now you see very nicely the, the, the columns names. So bat one, bat two, et cetera, and then the gene names. And here you have the uh, recapitulation of the number of cells. So it's a very small data set and it's from 2015, so there's 91 cells. Uh, and 23,000 uh, genes. And it's detected as a count matrix because you can also upload normalized data if you want. Uh, if you do so, then you will of course be limited because there are many, many uh, steps that you will not be able to run, uh, but it works as well. So you can also uh, upload already normalized data or integrated data that, that works as well. Um, okay, uh, so that was just for the example. So let me submit an, another one. Um, so if you, if you, so do I have like maybe 10x uh, here? I don't. Uh, but you can also upload uh, data directly from 10x. I don't know if you know, but in 10x, you can download a bunch of data sets uh, in uh, H5 format. So it's a proprietary format that you get once you run the Serenger pipeline. So you can also upload that directly here. It, it works as well. Uh, but here, so let, let's, let me then submit uh, the data. So here I can whether download the TARGZ data that I found from the Sura tutorial, so this PBMC data set. So I can download it on my computer and then upload it. Uh, I have it here so I can, I can show you. So if I do that, then I upload it and then it's detected as, what type of data is it? It's, uh, I think it's market file. Yeah, so it's detected as an MTX on market file. And then you see again this uh, this um, this um, this uh, summary of the 10 first columns and 10 first row uh, of your main matrix. Uh, but you can also, if you don't want to download it or it's too slow, your connection, for example, you can also copy the link address and can put it directly here and then the ASA portal will actually download the data for you directly on the server and then will uh, process the pre-processing uh, directly from the server. So you don't have to actually download it first on your computer and upload it. You can directly do it from the URL. Okay, uh, so then, then you need to select the organisms. So here we have all the organisms that are in Ensemble. So there's actually many, many of them. Uh, I think there's something like 500 different organisms that you can use. Uh, and then it will try to match the, the genes that you have here on the left with the ensemble database. So if it can find it, then it will be automatically annotated and given an ensemble ID. Um, and if not, then it will just keep the, the original gene name that it, it's found in your data. Uh, here, I know that the data, the PBMC data is human, so we'll keep the human uh, organism. Here you can pick the ASAP version. So the last one, as I told you, is the seven version. Uh, it's very, very recent. Actually, the sixth one was uh, was uh, uh, a change. Actually, we, we should also change the sixth version to not beta anymore. Um, and then you can also change the project type. So if you want to do bulk or single cell, as I told you before, you can do both on ASAP. Uh, but here today, I will focus on single cell. And then you can give a name to your projects, like uh, test project. Uh, that you can change afterwards if it, it's not uh, what you want to do. And then once you cl click the Create Project button, then you get to this front page that we saw before. Uh, and you can see that the parsing of your data is uh, 
first pending because it needs to create a, 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 a to call the Docker basically to run it. Uh, and then it's running, so it means that the parsing is currently ongoing. Uh, you see how much time it, it takes. And uh, for some steps, you can see also the expected time. So we have a, a predictor that says, uh, uh, well, the, this step should take this amount of time given the size of your own data set. Um, uh, but for the parsing, we, we don't have that. Uh, so it should not take too much time. So the parsing is basically creating a, all the stand-down metadata uh, that you have in a, a traditional file. Like uh, we count, for example, the mitochondrial content. Uh, we count the depths for each of the cells. And we store all this as, as metadata. Um, so, so now that the parsing is successful, so if you click on the vignette, then you see the, the output summary. Um, so you see that there was uh, 32,000 genes that were detected, 2,700 cells. Uh, it's indeed a count matrix. There's 97% of the values that are zero, which is traditional or expected for single cell data. It's a very, very uh, sparse data sets, uh, as you know. Um, and also, it, it, it's, it's good because it means that all the genes, so the 32,000 genes that were in the original data were all found in our ensemble database, uh, which makes sense because as you may have seen before, it was already ensemble ID, so then it's, it's easy. Sometimes it can be a bit more tricky if the the, um, the IDs are not ensemble IDs but are really gene symbols. Uh, sometimes you may have some that are not recognized or are, that are ambiguous. Uh, but here in our case, here in this data set, at least from, from the Surat pipeline, uh, it's ensemble IDs, so it's easy. And you can download the loom file that is generated by default with ASAP um, if, if you want to, 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 to export it and to run something on, on your own. Uh, voilà. Um, so that's the report part. Uh, but we also have like, now that we've passed the original data, now we can visualize the, the metadata that were created. So for example, at the cell level, we have, uh, of course, we have the cell IDs. Uh, like the actual barcodes that you have in your in your in your columns, uh, in your data set. Uh, we also generated a bunch of stuff automatically, uh, like the depths, which is just a sum of uh, of UMIs per cell. Uh, you also have the mitochondrial content, uh, the ribosomal content uh, that could be useful, and you will see afterwards with the uh, with the QC part. Uh, you can actually use this information to filter some of the cells that have for example, too much mitochondrial content. Uh, so that, that's automatically computed based on the ensemble mapping that we did. Since we know uh, the ensemble genes, so we know which genes are coming from the mitochondrial genome or uh, ribosomal genes, and, and so we can actually do the computation automatically. That's pretty, pretty simple one. OK, so now I go back to the pretreatment. So the parsing step was done. So now I go to the next step, so you see all the steps of the uh, downstream analysis pipeline that are here. So they, they in principle, should be run uh, uh, sequentially. So next step is a cell filtering. Um, so in this step, so what we want to do is to identify some cells that are outliers uh, or bad quality cells. Um, so once you click on this, then you, so you have a, a bunch of predetermined kind of QC that I will disable for now. For now. And then you have a few QC plots. Uh, so here you have like the traditional plot that you have also in the cell ranger output that I showed you before. So this is just the, uh, the, the traditional, traditional plot, except that of course you don't have the whole plot because the data that was loaded is filtered already. So all the, the cells that were empty were not present in the original data. So we always only have the top of the plot. Uh, but you can use that to filter maybe more uh, UMI. So for example, if you say, well, I want more than uh, 1,000 reads, I want more than, I don't know, 10,000 UMI per read, then you can do that, and then you will see uh, the filtering uh, automatically. Or maybe that's too, too harsh, I think. If you do that, then you see uh, the cells are filtered in the ones that are like that. Okay. Um, then you have the, so you have all the, the plots that are usually done in Surat. So now we'll come back to Surat. And and you see, so in Surat, well, so first you need to create a Surat object from the, the data that I've uploaded to, to ASAP. 
Then you have the, the QC part with the mitochondrial content that you need to specify yourself. So here it's done automatically on ASAP, so you don't need to do that. Uh, and then usually you have this kind of plot to try to spot some of the outlier cells. Uh, and these plots also are, are visible here. So there are all these plots basically. So detected gene plot that you see here. So that's uh, all your cells and all the cells that are kept. So here it's basically corresponding to, uh, is it this plot? Detected genes. Yeah, so N features is detected genes. So that's what you see here. Uh, so it's the same distribution basically. And you can say, okay, well, let's enable this. And then I want to keep only the cells that have more than a thousand detected genes. So then I activate this. And then you see that I keep only 500 cells out of my 2,700. And so it means that I have 2,000 that are discarded. And you can see the effect that it has on the distribution. So of course, if I do that, then it, it's basically a clear cut that you have here at 1,000. So you see the two distribution of the discarded and the, the kept cells. Uh, but you can also see the impact that it has on the other uh, plots. So this is a depth plot. So it's basically the end count that you have here in the second plot here. So the distribution here is the same. So it's all, but here you have it split again uh, by the um, different uh, specials that I've put here. Um, and you also have the percent of mitochondrial genes, so you can see again what effect it has to filter 1,000 detector genes on the mitochondrial distribution. Uh, but then I will here I will keep the the same the same thing as ah yeah there are also these two plots sorry I forgot to mention so we have this plot here so this one is basically this one um, and let's disable this so here you have all the the, the cells. And here you have the second plot, which is the uh, uh, number, the so depth basically versus the number of uh, detected genes. And this is also the plot that you have here, that here you can see. Uh, so basically, as you can see, it reproduces uh, all the plots that you have in the serrat pipeline for your uh, for your QC. Um, and here, what they chose in this tutorial is to keep 200 uh, UMI at least, uh, 200 detected genes, sorry, features. And then 5% mitochondrial, is it right? Yes, 5%. So that's what we will use here as well. So we use the same threshold. Uh, there's one threshold that we don't use is this one uh, because we, we don't have it currently in ASAP. That's something that we, we, we will probably add uh, uh, later. It's not really a big issue, so we can continue with this. Uh, and you see, so the, you see in the different plots, the effect that it has uh, so the ones that are discarded and the one that is kept. So usually it's good to see that uh, the discarded cells, of course, are the ones on the bottom. So really the ones which which are, were of a lower uh, lower uh, quality. Um, okay. Uh, so that was the cell filtering step. Ah, I didn't run it. Sorry. Get back. Okay, let's run it now. We said five and two hundred. Uh, there is a question. Let's run this and then I can answer the question. Okay. Uh, so this, you see, so I've, I've run the filtering step with the two thresholds that I, I've told you before. And now you can see that it's it's uh, pending now. And then soon it will be running on our server. So it's the case here. And once it's done, you will see it will, the, this little count that you see here uh, will actually appear as uh, validated. It means that, that now you can move to the next um, step. Okay. Uh, so what question is it? Um, so there are two questions I see. So what would be recommended in the workflow in case there are multiple samples or multiple count matrices? Um, so one way to do it is, is to just merge the two matrices together, and then you can upload them on ASAP. And then you can create afterwards. So I didn't show it, but actually in the metadata part, you can also import metadata. So you can import a new metadata, which contains uh, uh, like a batch kind of information where you have a zero for the first data set and one for the second data set. Uh, and then you can use afterwards for, for removing the, uh, the effect of the batch effect. So that's one way to go uh, get. Uh, the other way to go would be to to integrate the data sets together on a Surat first, and then to upload it on ASAP. Uh, that's another another possibility. Both both are possible. And then Zeba. So, what does a feature for person-person genes? 
Yeah, so uh, if I go back here, so here uh, you you may want to focus on the um, on the uh, on the number of protein coding genes or instead of mitochondrial or ribosomal genes. So usually uh, you expect to have a lot of reads that map to protein coding genes and not to uh, I don't know long long non coding RNA or mi RNA or or mitochondrial RNA and stuff like that. So maybe you want to just say, okay, I want at least uh, to have like a 95% of my reads in my cell to map to protein coding genes. I don't want all the other weird stuff. And then you can also set that as a special. Uh, and if I do that, then you see I discount 500 cells. And you, of course, you can also see the effect here on the different, uh, on the different uh, things. And uh, ribosomal, Genes, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, so you, so, so if all the the reads that map to ribosomal genes, uh, if you want, you can also uh, uh, filter out cells based on this threshold. Uh, it's not mandatory. Uh, it's just that sometimes you, so you you will see afterwards when you you visualize your data with the U map, then you can also display the for each of the cells and each of the clusters, you can display the percentage of mitochondrial, percentage of protein coding, percentage of ribosomal genes. And then sometimes you see some weird little cluster which contains a lot of ribosomal genes. So then you go back, as I was saying before, so you go back to this step and you say, okay, well, this I need to filter out because that's, that's too weird. Um, so that's one, one way to uh, remove. Uh, but you can, of course, uh, disable it and, uh, and, and don't use it, but it can be used this way. Um, asthma. Will you provide brief explanation on annotating cells? Yes. So this is basically the last step of the pipeline so that I will do at the end. Where exactly the computing happens? Uh, no, you don't need to be registered to ASAP to compute. So even if you're not registered, uh, it works. So it, it will uh, compute. Uh, so it runs actually on our server. So I have a very, very big server here at TPFL, uh, which was a terabyte of RAM, I think, and, and I don't remember how many cores, but it's really, it's, it's huge. Uh, so it can run many, many things in parallel. Uh, there's really no issue with this. Uh, you will see next week when we, we will run it, so like uh, 30 people together in principle should 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 be uh, should be fine. Uh, we Everything is, is queued. So basically, if, if there is an overcharge of the server, then you will just in like a waiting mode, and then you need to wait your turn before your computation is done. But uh, but yeah, but everything is run and there's really no limitation if you are registered or not. So you can run anything you, you want. Who can see the data analysis you are doing? So only you. Uh, so it's, it's very, very private. So whether you're registered or not registered, it's only you that can see what you're doing. Uh, of course, except if you, uh, so there is a, a possibility to make your data public to here. Uh, so if you set the project public, then of course everybody will be able to see it. Uh, but by default, you see here the, the project is private. So it means that it's only seeable by you, uh, unless you then chose to to share it with other people. So you can share it with emails. Um, and then it will be visible by the people with whom you shared it. Uh, but if not, by default, it's only you who can see uh, the data. Uh, Okay, what are the recommended default in ASA based on the QC? So we have some, so you saw it probably uh, when you do a new a new cell filtering, then uh, you have a lot of, uh, of default uh, uh, things that we've put, uh, but it's, it's very, very arbitrary, I would say. So depending on the species, depending on the tissue, depending on, on the technology that you use, if you use Danex or something else, it, it varies a lot. Uh, so we, we've put some default uh, kind of special parameters, but you see here it would really filter out too many cells, so I would definitely not use it for this project. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's something that you you need to to, to filter yourself. Uh, one way would be to keep with the default parameters that you have, like in Surat, which is this. Um, in our case, it works well. But that's that's something you can tune. So since you see how many are removed, how many are discarded, uh, you are able then to 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 tune the parameters accordingly to try not to remove too many cells.
uh, do we have to rent space to save our data? Uh, so no, uh, currently the there is a space limit. I think uh, it means that so all the data is stored in uh, on the server directly. Uh, we have a quite a big uh, uh, hard disk to store everything. But then if it's not accessed for I don't remember how long it is like uh, two weeks or something like that, then it's also automatically sent over to like a S3 storage. Uh, that we have here at EPFL, uh, and we have actually grants that that pay for this, so we don't charge anyone for storing the data. So the data is stored on on our server or on the uh, at three internally at EPFL, uh, so you don't need to pay for that as well. Um, so that's something that is included as well. Okay, so I think I've answered everything. Uh, so let's move uh, move on. So have you seen the uh, self filtering step is now finished? So you have a recap on the on the result count. You have a recap of the parameters that were used, um, and then you have a recap of the output. So you, now you have the new number of cells. So now you see that the remaining data set is two thousand six hundred four hundred cells, uh, which match what we saw before. Um, so now we can move to the next step, which is the normalization step. Uh, so again, you can create a new normalization. Uh, so we use here the Surat one. Uh, and here you need to select the data on which you want to normalize. Because if you want, you can discard the cell filtering and just directly normalize the raw count data. So that's something you, want, you may want to do. So the parsing step here is the raw count that you, you got at the parsing step. Or you can prefer doing it on the cell filtering, which in, in our case makes sense here because I mean, we filtered it for a reason. Uh, but you can also do both. So if you do that, then you will see it will run both in parallel, uh, and then you will get uh, then two data sets, and then you afterwards you can continue the pipeline with both uh, independently. So you can see the impact of the filtering compared to the raw count, for example. Uh, but here in our case, I will just run it on the cell filtering. Okay. Uh, and as before, uh, so you see it creates this little count, and, and here you have the progression report. Uh, that appear um, that shows uh, that it was pending and now it's actually running on the server. Um, you have other information here, so you see uh, like the num the number of the job. Uh, it's already like four hundred thousand jobs that run on on ASAP. Uh, and also the wait time. So the wait time is basically the initi initiation time it took to access the Docker before it started to run. And then you have the runtime, and uh, and you still have this information at the end. So here you see uh, still the how, how long it took to, to run the step, so 20 seconds, and how much RAM it used on the machine, so two, two gigabyte. Um, okay, so now the normalization is finished. So here there's no output, actually, it's just normalized. So that's the same kind of output that you have with, uh, with Surat, to just normalize the data. Uh, so that's ex exactly the same method that we have uh, here in ASA. Uh, and then the next step is to run the HVG, HVG, so the highly viable features computation. So now we can do it as well. Um, and here you see that actually you have multiple methods. So you can run the default one, the VST, which is the same as the one that is used here, I think, VST, with 2,000 features. Um, and this runs on the normalized data. So this you cannot run on the self featuring or the raw data set, you really need to run it on the, a, a normalized data set. Um, so here I run it on my normalized data. You can also select the number of features you want to, to keep. Uh, so I will keep the default 2000, which is a default one that it uses in, in, in Surat, and I can run it. And you can see that if I want, I can actually select another method and run it as well. And I can even run it with all methods, actually. Let's, let's try. And you see that they all run in parallel, basically. So, so you don't need to wait for one method to finish before the next one is run. They, they really all run in parallel on, on the server. Uh, so that's also good in terms of uh, speed, because then you can run multiple stuff in parallel. Uh, if you want, you can even run multiple projects in parallel. So cre create a new tab on your own uh, browser, and then run another project in another tab, and then you can run them in, in parallel as well. So that, that, that works as well. Um, okay, so here it's over. So here, uh, so here in this step, as you see here, there is actually a plot that is uh, uh, generated, and actually you can also see it if you click on the count. 
that brings you to this um, this um, this uh, kind of uh, uh, recap uh, thing where you see the parameters that we used. You can also see the the metadata that were generated. So this is like the the metadata name that is in the in the H five AD or the room file. Um, and also you can download the the the, the output. Uh, but you also see here the 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 the, the plot that was generated uh, in the path in the path of the uh, method. Uh, so it's dynamic. Um, and you see uh, it's the same as this one. So this one is maybe a bit uh, uh, crushed, but uh, here you see it uh, probably better, but you see it's exactly the same plot as this one. Uh, so we indeed generate the same thing. Voila. Uh, so, and of course, if you, you try on another and another of the methods, then you see that you will see that the plot is different, of course, because it's not the same method that was used. So we have slightly different uh, plots. Uh, and you can do it for each of the different methods that we run. Voila. Uh, okay, so now that the HVG method is done, then we can go to the next step, uh, which is the scaling of the data. So let's go to it. Um, so the scaling method takes into input the, uh, again, a normalized data set. Uh, so I take, again, my normalized data that I created before. Uh, and if you want, you can, uh, at this step, you can actually regress out some covariates. Uh, so let me first run it up. Uh, and then I can explain. Um, so while it's running. Uh, so, so actually, it's also described in the Serrat pipeline. Uh, if you have a source of variation that you want to remove, like um, uh, percentage of, of, uh, of mitochondrial RNA or batch effect or whatever, then uh, that's something you can you can do here uh, in uh, in Surat, uh, say stating which uh, variable you want to regress out, and this will be removed from your main signal. Um, and this is also possible to do here. So here, if you click on the select button, so you see all your different um, metadata that were generated by by ASAP, or that you uploaded yourself. As as I told you before, uh, I don't know if you remember, but you can also upload import your own metadata. It's possible to, to import metadata like as a list or as a matrix, um, and then it will be added to the uh, uh, ASAP object. And then uh, from here, from the scanning step, if you have a meta metadata called batch, for example, then you, you will see it here, and then you will be able to, to remove it. So you can select them uh, as many as you want, and then they will be uh, removed at the same time as the scanning is done. So here I select a known because I don't want to regress out anything. That's what they do here in the in the pipeline, and I try to match it as much as possible. But uh, if if needed, you can also do it here. Okay, so the scaling is done. Uh, so the next step is actually the um, the PCA run PCA. Uh, here by default in Serrat, uh, they run uh, fifty PCs, I think. So first you need to select a scaled data because the PCA worked only on scaled data, not normalized data. So you can select your scale data set. Uh, and then you can select also the uh, viable features that you selected. So here I have three possibilities because I've run three methods to show you that you can run several in parallel. Uh, but here I will stick to the VST, which is the one that is used in the Surat uh, tutorial. Um, and then you select the number of uh, principal components that you want to generate with the PCA. Uh, so here we'll just uh, select the default 50 that is used uh, by the Surat pipeline. Um, yeah, and then again, so then it it, it goes into this uh, this loop, uh, and then it will be uh, generated. Uh, so as you remember, so the PCI is really the entry point for all the different tools afterwards, so all the other downstream analysis. So if you want to run a TSNI or a UMAP, then you don't run the UMAP on the, or the TSNI on the normalized data or the matrix, you run it on the PCA. So the PCA is very, very important uh, when you're doing a serenistic uh, uh, analysis because that's really the entry point for the TSNI, the UMAP, and also for the clustering as, as, as well, because the clustering as well is run on, uh, on the PCA. Okay, so it's done. Uh, but here you see, you don't see the PCA directly from this card. So if you want to see it, you need to go to the visualization pane uh, and then I will explain a little bit in more details what you can do with the visualization pane. Um, 
so here, when you click on visualization, then you get this uh, thing that I showed you before, where you see, so every every dot here is a cell. And here you have DIM1 is the first uh, principal component of the PCA, and DIM2 is the second principal component of the PCA. And on the right, you have the control panel, so you can remove it. But uh, uh, if you open it, then you, you have multiple options to display different coloring and different uh, 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 graphical options, I would say. Uh, so if you go in the general panel, so you can uh, change, for example, I don't know, the dot opacity uh, or the dot size. Uh, you can also display the cell names when you hover. Uh, here, by default, it's not activated, which means that if you hover on the cells, you don't see their names which usually it's not really needed when you do single cell uh, RNA uh, analysis, but it's something that we activate, for example, for bulk analysis where you have sample names. It could be useful to see the sample names when you order uh, your, your dots. Um, and then, of course, you can color. Uh, so whether you put no coloring, uh, which is a default, or you can color by three different uh, um, modalities. So whether you want to use continuous um, uh, metadata, uh, like gene expression, for example, or other uh, metadata. Uh, like if I click on, on numerical uh, data, metadata, I have like the matter control content that was automatically uh, created. So if I select this, then you see uh, automatically the plot will be colored by the matter control content. And you have the, um, the legend here. Uh, you can also color by ribosomal content. And you see that it's pretty well uh, uh, sparse. So you don't really. So usually this step is used when you have like really a cluster, a real cluster, and you want to see if you don't have like a huge uh, value of ribosomal content uh, at some uh, at some place. Uh, uh, and you have also the protein coding content and stuff like that. But you can also uh, color by gene expression. So here you select which. Uh, which matrix you want to use. So you want to, to plot based on the row count or you want to plot the normalized counts or the scale counts. By default, it, I, I feel it's better to use the normalized counts. So here, if you enter your gene, so here you see the list of, of genes that exist, uh, which are all the genes that were present in your data. You can pick one like that, or you can autocomplete, uh, like if I do C14, for example, um, then you see the expression of CD14 gene in, in your data. Uh, so you see that apparently it's, it's a bit specific to this cluster here. Um, and for now, uh, I think that's it. Uh, of course, PCA is not the best representation. So probably you will not spend too much time on the PCA uh, data. Um, but you want to go back and then to run the, the TSNI and the UMAP. Uh, so TSNI is run on the PCA. And again, you can select. So here it's it's the same as, as what is done in, in Surat. Uh, so you can select the number of PC that you want to use. So usually they use 10, well, not usually, but at least in this example, they use 10 um, PCs of the PCA. Um, so here, let's do the same. We use 10 PCs from the PCA that were computed. Uh, and I will do the same with QMAP, UMAP. Uh, so I can run uh, 10, like, and just for the example, I can run the default that we've put at 50. Uh, so you can see the difference, but in principle, it should not be a huge difference. Ah, there is a question. In your experience, is 50 PC the default in search zero tutorial a good number? Well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, that's That depends on your data set. Uh, so basically, so there is a way in, in Surat, uh, so it's not really visible here anymore, but you have this elbow plot, uh, yeah. or you can also run a Jack Straw uh, analysis to try to guess what is the best number of PCs that you should use. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, it's not implemented in ASAP, the, the Jack Straw. That's something we also consider to do, probably to help the user to select the correct number of PC, uh, but that's not currently possible. Uh, but usually, from our expertise, uh, the okay. default values are OK. So sometimes you see a few differences, but not too much. Uh, the main limitation is if you work with really big data sets. So if you work with the traditional 10x data sets, uh, which contains like from, I don't know, 4,000 to 10,000 cells, 
uh, then then it's okay to work with uh, 30, 50, even 10 PCs. It, it's fine. It works, generates pretty similar results. Um, but if you work with much more cells, uh, for example, if you have like integrated data sets, um, then it will start to, to be limited and you will see that weird uh, clusters that seems to be bundled together. So then you, will, you may want to increase the number of PCs. Uh, so basically, it's rescaled according to the number of cells and the number of cell types or population cell population that you have in your data set. So the more cell types, the more cell population, and the more PC you should use. Um, and reversely, the less cell types, the less uh, cells, and the less uh, PCs you should use. So in this example, that makes sense why they use 10 PCs. Um, it's mainly because they have only 3,000 cells, and uh, and you will see uh, in the UMAP that um, there is a very small number of cell population. Uh, so so that makes sense actually to um, to use only 10 PCs. But that's something that you can always uh, work on. You, you saw I I've tried two just to show you uh, here on, in the visualization. Now I can use whether my uh, uh, 10. So the first one was a 10. So here it's a UMAP plot with 10 PCs. And this is a UMAP plot with 50 PCs. Uh, you may see, so it's shifted a bit, but uh, which is normal because UMAP is, is completely uh, randomly generated. Uh, but you see the population are the same. So it doesn't really change much the results. So as I said before, it's it mainly if you really work with very, very big data sets uh, that it can have an impact. But if you work with small enough data set, usually it's okay to work with 10, 50. It doesn't change that much the result. Well, that's from my experience. So, can we check for more than a gene at a time? Yes, we can check for more than a gene. So this three channel here, um, you can enter multiple genes. You can so there's three genes max it's not more than that but here you have a three channel so you have the you can enter a first gene that will be colored uh, on the red channel you can enter another one that will be colored on the green channel and here you see the overlap of the two colors together um and then you have a blue channel as well uh, i don't know what gene the name to put here but uh so if i take the uh, example here so do, I, do they have any names yes i take this And then another one like this. And then here you see the different uh, the different coloring, and you see the different uh, place where the gene like now it's possible. It's possible to do that. There you go. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's also possible actually to to use more genes, uh, but then you need to use a, a, a features in uh, in Surat that is called the module score, um, which is here actually. Uh, whether you you importing your own gene set, uh, so you can create a gene set and import it as a as a metadata, uh, as I showed before, and uh, and then you can put as many genes as you want, and then you can basically it will create a score that take the average of expression of all the genes that you've entered compared to a background. Uh, so if you do that, then you will see um, you will see the average expression of all the genes that you've picked uh, uh, compared to the background. It, it will color according to this uh, scoring. It's called module score. It's, it's, a, it's a method that is uh, implemented in Serret that we've kept here because that we, we think it's very cool. And you can also use, so you can use it with custom uh, metadata that you would create or that are generated automatically. Uh, but you can also do it with like global gene sets like drug bank or human gene atlas. I don't know if, I, if there is anything interesting like B cell, bone marrow. Yeah, I don't know. It maybe doesn't make sense in, in this example. But so then you see it creates a score. And then you have like the blue score, which means it's it's uh, not enriched or, or it's um, reversely enriched. Or red means that it's very enriched. So you can cover. So in I, I've picked bone marrow. Maybe it doesn't make sense at all in PBMC, of course. But uh, but yeah, you can you can pick any any anything you want and any group of, of genes that you want, and it will create this score to 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 color your your plot. 
Uh, yeah, if you want to reproduce the last questions before, maybe we will do a little break of like 10 minutes. Um, so the last question is to reproduce the exact same UMAP plot. Uh, is there something similar to set seed required? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so we don't have that actually. Uh, so basically we always use the same seed. Uh, uh, I don't know if it would be useful to actually allow the user to put a seed it himself or herself. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so it, it will not reproduce exactly what was done on uh, on the Surat um, on the Surat pipeline, of course, because we don't use the exact same seed. Um, but it should be close enough uh, in principle. Uh, in ASAP, it will generate all the time the same thing because it will always use the same seed. Uh, but um, but yeah. I, I, currently, we cannot change this. OK, uh, so maybe let's do a quick round. So yeah, so we stop at the, um, so we did all the pretreatment uh, things. So we did the TSNI, so you said it run. And we run two UMAP, one with 10 dimensions, one with 50 dimensions. And then now in the visualization part, you can actually visualize all of this. So you can visualize the TSNI. You can visualize the uh, the PCA, and you can vis uh, visualize the UMAP. Uh, usually, uh, nowadays, people are mostly working with uh, with UMAP uh, data. Uh, you, I don't know if you know why, but it's it's like it's better to represent the intercluster distance, uh, which means that usually in a TISNI, uh, your clusters can be put really completely randomly. Uh, so. If you have two clusters that are close together, it doesn't mean that they come from similar cell types, population. Um, but in a UMAP, it is more the case. So usually in a UMAP, if two clusters are very close together, it means usually means that uh, they, they come from more similar cell types. So it, it preserves this kind of structure of uh, cell types and uh, cluster um, uh, position. And if you have a, a cluster that is very, very far away from the other, it means that in principle, it means that uh, the cell types is very different than the other one. Um, okay, so here, uh, so let's get back to our Surat pipeline. So, so we had the the PCA plot, which is here, uh, and we have it also here. So I plot the PCA. Let me remove the coloring. So you get this. I will enlarge a little bit the the cells. Okay. Um, and then you see that it's it's the same as the one that we have in the Surat pipeline, except that it's shifted uh, on the x-axis. But that's just normal. I mean, the PCA also uh, can can shift uh, plus minus on on some axis, so that that, that doesn't make sense. That's that's not an issue. Um, so we have this here. Um, and if you plot the U map with uh, ten PCs, so the first U map. Uh, you can see that it's uh, it's also similar kind of with what you have here. Uh, so you have this little cluster here that is probably this green cluster here, uh, and then you have this cluster with the little uh, little thing here, which is this one. You have this very alone cluster here, which is this one, and then you have this uh, uh, bottle shaped cluster here that is that is here. It's a very specific term, uh, bottle shaped cluster, um, but yeah. So you, you get that. Um, so now what you want to do is something that I skipped for now, which is a clustering of the cells, um, which is in the Surat pipeline can be done before or after. It's the same in ASAP. So we could have run it just after the PCA, but we prefer to run the TSNI and the UMAP, uh, but it, it's available. So it's outside of what we call the pretreatment because um, it's, I would say, so we chose to do that because usually we like the pretreatment part to be very, very linear. So you go from the top to the bottom and then you run everything uh, uh, together. While the clustering can run a bit when you want um, and you can run it again and you can run multiple clustering. So it's it's really a bit different than the pretreatment part uh, we thought. That's why we separated it here. Um, and similarly, you can create a, a clustering. Um, so when you run the clustering, you need to specify a PCA. So of course you can run multiple PCA. So here I have only one. Uh, and then you select the one you, you want to run it on. And then you, again, you need to select the number of PC. Uh, so here we will select 10. 
And finally, you need to specify a resolution parameter. So I don't know if you know what is a resolution parameter, but it's basically a parameter that is used by the modularity part of the clustering, which which is very arbitrary. I think by default it's 0.8. Um, in Surat, they use here 0 0.5. So let's try it. Uh, but basically, uh, so we have an info bully here, uh, and it says that uh, basically the the higher the resolution value and the more clusters you will get. So it's just a parameter to tune the number of clusters that you want. So here I can try, for example, with one resolution and with two resolution, and you will see the output. So the, again, they all run in parallel, and you will see the output at the end. You will see that the number of clusters is, is different. So in principle, we should have less clusters with the 0 0.5 parameter, which is the first one here. And as much as, as, as you increase the uh, resolution, then you will have more and more clusters. Um, okay, so the first one is done. So the one that is uh, the same as in the Serrat pipeline. So in the Serrat pipeline, they get eight plus one, so nine clusters. And here we also get nine clusters. Uh, but you see when you increase the resolution, then with a resolution of one, then you get 11 clusters. And with the resolution of two, you get 15 clusters. So that's, that's the part of the pipeline where it gets very arbitrary uh, because then you will need to go back and forth as I, as I showed you before. Um, trying to, to guess or to fit the better number of clusters. Um, so we can visualize it on the U map. So if you go back to the visualization uh, step, uh, then this time you go to the discrete because it's a categorical metadata or discrete metadata that we are using. Um, and then you see the three clusterings. So the first one is the one with the 0 0.5 resolution. And here you see the nine cluster that were generated and you see the number of cells in each of them. Um, if you over, uh, hover with your mouse, you can see the um, the uh, cluster the cells belong to. So here it's cluster one, two, uh, five, seven. The order is random, so it's not one, two, three. Um, and then you see the different clusters. Um, but if you want, you can also display the other resolutions ones. So here, this one is nine cluster, so from one to nine here. Uh, cluster, but if you plot the second clustering, then you have 11 clusters. So you see that it's splitted a little bit more this uh, big uh, thing here and also this one. Um, and if you go here, you can see again uh, uh, even more uh, clusters. So here you have that 15. Um, the, um, if you go to the clustering step, you have also the possibility com to compare your clustering. Uh, for example, if you want to compare like clustering 0 0.5 with clustering 2, and you want to look at the overlap between the two clusters, then you can see that uh, so the, the, the one with resolution 0 0.5, uh, the first cluster is overlapping with the first cluster of the second clustering. The second one is overlapping with the fourth one of the second clustering. And then you see some like, um, like this one, which seems to be split. Uh, so this is the one that gets split actually based on the uh, increase of the resolution. So we can also display this kind of information. Okay, so let's go back to the U map and let's go back to the official official clustering. It's, I say official, but it's very arbitrary, as I said. Um, what did I do? Up. Ah. What's going on? Yeah, refresh that. I don't know what's going to Okay. So, uh, so here we have the cluster. So if you look back at the cluster that were found with the Serrat pipeline, so you have this thing that is one cluster. So that's what we have here. That's probably this cluster here. Uh, we have this little tail that is one cluster. So that's also what we have here. Uh, and then you have two clusters. That's also what we have here. So for now, it's good. We have the same clusters. Uh, we have this cluster nine here that seems to be a bit alone. That's what we see here as well. And then we have this one, which is splitted into four different clusters. Uh, and that's also what we observe here. So it seems that we get fairly similar clusters than with the, the Serrat pipeline. OK. Um, any questions? Can you run the clustering in the UMAP dimensions? Uh, you cannot do that. Uh, so that's something that we allowed to do before. 
Uh, I think if you go to the bulk pipeline, you still be you should still be able to do it. But I I would say it's very wrong to do it. I, as a bioinformatician, you you should probably not do it. So that's why we did not allow it uh, because uh, that's not the way it should be done. Comparing the association of cells between different clusters is very nice to know. I have a question regarding this. Okay, I just just write it down and then and I will try to answer. Um, okay, so that's the clustering part. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so now I need to, oh, ah, yeah, now I need to wait for the evidences to run. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, so something I didn't show before is now that we have like categorical uh, metadata, like a clustering is a categorical metadata, I have different categories, it's not continuous. Um, you can can go back to this and display some gene expression like CD14, for example. Uh, and then you see again, so in this, the UMAP this time, you see the expression of CD14 that is specific to this cluster apparently. And you can show the, the stats according to a specific metadata. So if I want to show the expression of this gene according to the first clustering, then you see the different clusters, and you see that this gene is expressed mostly in cluster number three. Um, so yeah, and, and if you have some annotations that I will show you afterwards, uh, then you also have a recap here. So that's a, a way when you are in this view of gene expression, is it's a way to display not only the gene expression, but also some information relatively to like a clustering at all to an important metadata, uh, and also if it's linked to any uh, informative uh, annotations. Okay, um, so the next step, if you go back to the um, to the uh, pipeline, so the next step is the uh, almost final step, I would say, which is the, um, the, 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 the calculation of the, the marker genes uh, for each of your clusters. So in ASAP, there's actually two ways of doing this. Uh, the first one is the one that I activated already, but it takes a bit of time to, to, to compute. Um, so if you go to discrete and then you select a clustering of your interest, then you get this view, uh, which is the view that we, we call the annotation view, where you see all the different clusters. Uh, you can select a cluster in particular or multiple ones. You see the, the, the cells that are in, in them. And here you, say the, you see the best annotation, which is empty for now because I didn't create any. Um, but here, if I want, I can actually annotate each of my clusters based on, on marker genes that I know uh, of. Uh, so for example, if I, I click here, so the first cluster is this one, um, you see that uh, there is this tab here, evidences, that is now finished. So it, it was computing before, but now it's over, um, where you can uh, see the up and down regulated genes. And you can actually um, uh, select uh, the genes that are the marker genes. So that computes basically the what called evidences are the marker genes for all the evidences for an annotation that you want to do. Um, so here you see that the, there are some genes that I express here, like CCR7 and LEP1 and LBHB. Um, and then if you go back to Surat, uh, I think they have a nice, yeah, they have here a nice. Um, a nice tab where they say that CCR7 is naive CD4 plus T cell. Um, so indeed, it seems that CCR7 is a marker gene for this uh, cluster. So then you can go back uh, and you can create a new annotation. Uh, so here it uses uh, the um, the uh, the uh, the uh, the ontology. So you have multiple ontologies that we use for annotating the cells. Uh, we always encourage the users to use an ontology for annotation, uh, even though you could actually put some, some free text. Uh, but we believe that using ontology is better for reproducibility, but also for integration um, across data sets, because sometimes people will annotate a specific cluster in a way. Uh, sometimes it will make some typo. And then sometimes when you want to integrate multiple data sets, you end up with so many different names for the same cell type that it, 
becomes complicated to integrate. Uh, and since we are very into this fairness principle, uh, we, we, we try to, to, to implement multiple ontology to help you annotate your data. Uh, so you can, you can use it to, um, to actually uh, annotate your data sets. And if you don't find it, uh, then of course it's okay. Then you can use uh, the free text. Uh, but yeah, by default, I would, I would encourage to use this. Uh, and then here you see, I selected this, um, which is probably not exactly what was before, but it's, it's okay. Um, and, um, and then it means that when I will press save, it will annotate my cluster with this uh, annotation. I can also put here some uh, evidences that I found. So the evidences that I found is in this tab, I can put it here. Uh, so what was it already? It was a CCR7. So we, we, we use CCR7 to, to, to annotate this cluster with, uh, with this gene. So I put it here. This is my evidence that this cluster is indeed the CD4 plus. And then you save it. And then you see your annotation is automatically uh, put here as a new annotation. You have the automatic annotation from ASAP, which is just a number, which is the cluster number uh, that you may not need. Uh, but here your annotation uh, is put here. Well, so you have the annotation, uh, so the name of the, in the anthology, and you have the, the, the marker genes that you use. And here you have on the right, you have the um, a possibility to upvote or to downvote the annotation. So of course, if the, if the project is private and it's only you that can see uh, the project, then it's not useful. But if you start sharing the project or if it becomes a public project, that can be useful because other people can upvote or downvote a specific annotation so that uh, it gets higher in the ranking, uh, maybe because it's more suited or there is a new name in the ontology that appeared so that you want to update your, your annotation. Um, and then it, it, gets, it gets with a higher rank. Uh, and that's, this is what you get here. So here, what you remember when you are in this, uh, so I can go back. So if you are in the plot, you go back and then you color, coloring, discrete, you select your cluster. At least not this one, it's this one. And um, and then here you, you see this column that was empty before because there was no annotation. Uh, and now you have actually uh, the best annotation. So the one that is more upvoted uh, that appear here uh, with both the ontology term and the, uh, the, um, the name of the genes that were used for supporting this annotation. Um, and of course you can do that then afterwards for all the different uh, clusters. So for example, let's take, well, I took the first one, let's take the last one. Um, so here, what is it? So the evidences are PPBP. So that's, a, that's this one, so that's platelet cells. Uh, so then I can I can go back, create a new annotation. So I say, okay, that's late, late, that correspond to this ontology term. And then I put, uh, no, not late, but P, P, what was it? P, 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 B, P, P, B, P. And then up, I save it. And then it's created here. Uh, and then if you go back, then you see it here now, it's, correctly annotated as a platelet, and the supporting evidence is this PPBP uh, gene. Let, let's see if it's correct, actually, I didn't check. Uh, uh, so if I go to continuous gene expression, and then I put PPBP, so then indeed you see that PPBP is very, very expressed in this cluster, so this one was the last cluster, cluster nine, and you see it again in this uh, view here uh, of expression by cluster. Okay, um, what else? Uh, so that's convenient for annotation and for, 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 for sharing also like your annotation with other people and also for finding this, um, this evidences uh, if you want to see like the, the marker genes uh, in your data. So you have this, this, this graph here. You can change actually the uh, thresholds. So if you want to have more genes, you can also so here I, I increased to four chains greater than 1.3. By default, the fold change was, was threshold was two. Uh, but if I want to be more lenient, I can change the threshold to 1.3, and then you see all the different results here. Uh, you can also change the FDR threshold, um, and then it will update uh, the table. Um, 
Okay, so the last thing that uh, you can do is the, um, so the so there are two more things that you can do. Uh, so if you want to run a DE, you can also do it through the DE or differential expression uh, step. Uh, so here again, we use the Surratt Wilcoxon test. It's a default one for differential expression. Um, and, uh, and then here you can select a clustering like cluster one, for example. And here you, you have multiple options. So whether you do all against complementary, so let's run this one. And this will basically produce the same results as the one you saw before in this evidences tab. So it will take every cluster and it will um, it will compare this cluster of cells versus all the other cells. Uh, so that's a way to, to, to have it in, in another way. You will see, uh, in, in this tab, the, you have more detail. In the evidences, you just have the table, and that's it. In this tab, you will be, be able to, to highlight some genes of interest, uh, transcription factors, uh, surface markers, and stuff like that. So you have more options in this view than in the evidences view. Um, so that's a good way, probably, to, to run it anyway. Um, but you can also do something else. You can also, if you have some clusters that are very, very similar, and you don't know if they are really different cell types or if it's actually the same cell type, what you can do is you can pick a cluster of interest, like cluster four, and run a comparison with cluster, I don't know, eight, for example. And then you run it, and then it will basically uh, do really only these two clusters comparison. So it's not a marker gene anymore, so it's really differential expression that we're doing. And you really try to find what is different between those two clusters uh, in case you have some weird things or you, you want to get more in depth into some of your interesting clusters, or if you have some conditions, because if you may approve also data with uh, different conditions or different culture uh, or uh, disease state or um, uh, tumor state and stuff like that, and then maybe you want to compare tumor versus non-tumor, so you want to do really two groups and compare these two groups, that's also possible. Uh, and then you get this, uh, this view here. Uh, with, with basically all your results. So here you see the results for group one versus everything. And here you see the results of group four versus group eight. And you have here the column of the upregulated genes and here the column of the downregulated genes. So if you go back to like group nine, for example, then again, you see this PPBP uh, results um, that is here and, uh, and you, you get again this uh, results uh, that we had before. Uh, but you also have the marker view. So you can also, sorry, you can also filter here uh, based on the uh, FDR and full chain. And you also have the marker view. The marker view allow you to see everything at once. So, so whether the top 10 genes or the top, I don't know, 20 genes for each of the clusters, so you see the up in green and the down in, in, in red uh, for each of the clusters. Um, so here you have the ref and the comparison cluster. Uh, and then you can highlight stuff like, for example, you want to highlight which of the DE genes are transcription factors. Then you click this, and then it refreshes everything, and then it should highlight. So you see here, it highlights the transcription factor, uh, both in the up and the down regulated genes. Um, you can also highlight surface markers, which can be useful if you have some validation to do, for example, for some, some cell types population. Uh, then again, you click uh, surface markers, and then it will highlight in both conditions which which ones are uh, the surface markers. Um, so that could be also useful. So that you cannot do with the evidences tab. So you really need to do it here from the different expression. Uh, but yeah, that could be useful depending on what uh, what you try to to do, or if you want to do some validation and uh, stuff like that. Uh, something that I didn't show before is in the in the visualization, you can actually you can actually um, do a lasso selection. So that I didn't show before. Uh, let's put all the colors again. So you see, for example, in this cluster, you have some cells. It's difficult to select, but you have some cells that are not from cluster nine, a cluster from cluster five, and others that are from cluster three. This happens. This is problem with uh, clustering methods, especially when you do the clustering on the PCA. Uh, so you can try to, to solve this by just reducing the number of PCs that you use for the clustering, then you will get much cleaner uh, clustering. Uh, but usually that's not really an issue. 
because of the, the outliers yeah, that are doing this. But sometimes you may want to select a cluster yourself because sometimes you try a million different parameters for the clustering, so different resolution, and you never really find the cluster that you want to, to find. So uh, really a small number of cells, I don't know, like this one, and you want really to see what is special for these cells. Uh, so it's possible, as you see, uh, using whether the box or the lasso selection, so you can select a bunch of cells, you create a new metadata from these cells, like, um, I don't know, my cells, and then it will create a new metadata containing only those cells. So basically, it will be it will be a metadata at the cell level with one for the cells that you selected and zero for all the other ones. Uh, and then from this, you can uh, again you can do a differential expression, for example. So you can go in the differential expression uh, step, uh, create a new one, um, and then here in the group, you can select the selection that you just made. And you can select your reference group. So the one you selected is one. The compared group is zero. And you can run a differential expression on this. And then you will find what is special for the cells that you actually selected. So that could be useful when the clustering doesn't really match what you want to see, which, which happens very often, uh, sadly. But uh, yeah, so that's a way to, to focus on some specific cells that may not be readily visible in your clustering. Okay, um, and the last step is the um, functional analysis. So here again, you have the modus score that I told about, but as a separate step, in case you want to do a modus score calculation and you want to store it for later, for example, uh, so it creates really a new metadata that you can use afterwards all the time, so you don't need to recompute it all the time. Uh, because if you use it from the visualization, as I showed before, it's computed on the go. So then if you switch to another one, then it's the previous one is deleted while here you can keep it for later. Um, and here you can also do some gene enrichment. Uh, so you can you take a DE of interest, uh, like uh, I can select everything that I've done before. So like the the, uh, the DE I've run with all, you know, all clusters. Uh, and then you can run um, uh, global gene set enrichment, uh, like you can enrich your results into biological, go biological processes, reactome drug bank, if you want to see if there are some drugs that are uh, involved in this. Uh, and then you run the enrichment. And you can run on uh, gene atlas if you want to see some uh, cell types or some uh, organs of interest and that would <clears throat> be enriched in the cells you, you selected on the, the DE genes that you, you found. So that's a way to help you also for the annotation later, because sometimes the annotation can be tough. Um, so these kind of things can help you to, to prioritize some uh, biological pathways or some, some cell types or drugs that may be useful uh, for, for your, your problem. And again, you have the same view as the view for the differential expression, where you see the pathways that are upregulated for each of your clusters. Um, and uh, and you can you can open it and you see like uh, for example for cluster I don't know which one I click for cluster two or which one I click let's click the last one so cluster eight then it seems to be enriched with the drug N for million <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that I'm not the chemist sorry. But uh, yeah, so basically you can you can also use that to help you annotate uh, your own cluster. Um, voila. Uh, I will try to answer the question because I think I must be down now. It's unless I forgot something. Let's see your questions. Um, start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I have a data that was processed earlier and cluster and data by experts when I do the components again and getting different numbers of clusters. Yeah, so that's that's the case. Uh, clustering is very, very arbitrary and random as well. So it, it may depend on the pack version of the packages. So that's why actually we keep all the versions of the packages because sometimes you change a version of one packages and then you change completely your clustering results or your UMAP or it can change a lot, even if you use the same uh, seed. It can also depend on 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 your your computer your computer if you use R if you use Python of course all of that have, have an impact it's, that's why it's difficult to fully reproduce results usually uh, 
you really need to to have it in the docker as we did uh with fixed parameters fixed versions for all the packages to really be able to to reproduce perfectly with some results um to compare yeah to compare two data sets uh so you need to to integrate them together that's usually what is done so that you cannot do currently with asap so that's something we are implementing but currently that's not something that you can do using asap so if you want to 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 do that then you will need to go do it uh, outside of asap or you need to integrate outside of asap and then you put it on asap to help you annotate the the cells that uh, fall together basically uh, then ontology is super nice. Thank you. Surface marker is nice. Thank you. Uh, TF and surface markers, they come from gene ontology. Yeah, Fabrice already answered that. Uh, yeah, th there's a very nice question from, uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, Gert. So I'm Gert. Um, uh, are, you, are you considering to implement some automated annotation in the future? Uh, actually, we already did that. Uh, we actually collaborated recently with uh, two groups, so a group from UNIL, uh, which is called B BG. Uh, they are developing another website called BG. And we also uh, collaborate with a group in uh, ETH in Zurich uh, from um, uh, Mark Robinson School. And we actually developed already um, uh, an automated uh, annotation pipeline, uh, but it's still under benchmarking. Uh, so we 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 are in the verge of of implementing it in ASAP. Uh, so that's something that we we want to to add uh, in the near future uh, to help people to annotate the data set. Because as I said before, usually the step of annotation is really really tough and takes a lot of time. And usually experts or literature uh, search and stuff like that. So here in ASAP, you can be uh, helped with the functional analysis tool uh, to some extent. And of course, depending on the uh, species that you are working on, then you can be more or less uh, helped. So if you work with mouse, human, or prosophila, then usually it's not too hard to annotate yourself. But if you work with uh, other uh, species, then it can become very, very hard. So, so yeah, so for now we have, uh, we have a pipeline, we have a tool for automatic annotation. We actually use ontology for training a, a classifier system. So we really use uh, the hierarchical tree of ontology to help the classifier to classify the, the, the cells. Uh, but yeah, it's not yet uh, in production. So we are still working on it, uh, but that's something that should come out uh, in the near future. Uh, then Nastasia, isn't it dangerous to manually select the clusters that think they should be Yes, it is dangerous, of course. Uh, usually, it's much better to to keep the uh, the unsupervised clustering and then just uh, stick with that. Uh, but sometimes the unsupervised clustering they they can really react weirdly, and sometimes you you want you see a cluster that should be split in two. You know it. You see it with the marker genes. And you try different resolution, and then it splits everything else, but not this one. And it's, it can be very, very frustrating, actually. So I guess this option is, is good if you want to verify something or if you want to, to compute a specific DE. Uh, but, uh, but that's not something that you would use in the end for the annotation, I would say. So the annotation, I would still do it on the, cluster, the main clustering results. Uh, even if you need to annotate the cluster as two different ontology terms, so that's something you can do. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's, it's not dangerous. It's more like uh, it's biased, I would say. Um, and finally, cell cycle export and run in R. Uh, so cell cycle, we we did not implement it. So we 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 don't have cell cycle scores. Um, that's something, yeah. That's something probably we need to do. Uh, but yeah, currently it's not. Uh, it's not. So we don't compute the cell cycle scores. Um, it's yeah. That's something we could actually do for like human and mouse. That should not be too tough to do. That's a good suggestion. Actually, maybe we can we can implement that at least for human and mouse, where where we have very defined set of genes that belong to cell cycle different uh, different phase. So that's something we could do. Um, but we yeah, currently we don't have it. 
but we, you, yeah, as you say, you can export, you can run in R. So that 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 I showed at the very beginning in the tutorial part. You have a, a part um, tutorial four, how to work with Loom files created by ASAP. So here, it's you can always when you're in a project, you can always export it to a Loom file, and then you can um, or H five D file, and then you can use these two scripts here. So whether this one or this one to um, to import it in R environment or uh, Python environment, and then you can continue working on it. So if you want to run the self cycle, you can do it afterwards in R or in Python, for example. So that's uh, that's always doable uh, with ASAP. And in principle, when you do that, you have everything that is computed that is present within the Loom file. So the Loom file contains the uh, row count matrix, the normalized matrix, the scale matrix, the um, the, the, the the PCA, the UMAP, the clustering. It contains really everything. Uh, the only thing that is not present is the annotation because currently we cannot really store it in the Loom file, uh, so that we don't have. But all the rest of the metadata is is stored in the Loom file, so you can, in principle, reproduce the whole thing, or you can recreate a Surat object, for example, if you want to continue the analysis on Surat on your own computer. So that's uh, that's possible. Uh, then Gert, I think it. Can be quite interesting to identify the algorithm on macro or gene or number them. Yes. Yes. Uh, so for now, we optimized it for a few um, uh, organisms. So where we know what are the mitochondrial genes. Uh, so we said, yeah, we know the mitochondrial genes are the one that starts with MT, MT, uh, little MT, uh, big MT, uh, caps MT, uh, MT with uh, hat or whatever. Um, so, so that we did for some organism, but it's true that we didn't do it for all organisms. So it can be that sometimes you have some organisms where the mitochondrial genes are all zero. Uh, and this is probably due to the fact that the annotation is not uh, yet done. Um, so if this happens, uh, don't hesitate. So if there is a, a button here, a feedback button, uh, you have also at the bottom of the website, you have also the uh, the email contact. So don't hesitate to, to send us an email and then we can have a look at it. Uh, usually we are pretty responsive to the users of ASAP. Uh, we had already some questions like that, so we implemented them quite, quite fast. So if you need uh, to have this information really for a non-model organism, then just tell us and then you can, uh, you can, you can have it. Can we implement maturation directory as well? Uh, what do you mean by maturation directory? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, you mean like a trajectory analysis or stuff like that? Yeah, so yeah, so trajectory analysis is something we originally had, and it was a nightmare to work with. Uh, especially in our lab, we have uh, I, uh, Walter Salens. There is actually a postdoc in our lab. And I don't know if you know the paper from Walter, but uh, it's a paper where he compared, I don't know, 50 different trajectory methods. Uh, so we have this expert in the lab and uh, we discussed a lot actually uh, with him. Um, so that's something we, we could have, but but yeah, it's it's something that is very tough and very also, I, I consider very arbitrary because there are some trajectory methods that works well uh, in some cases, but not others. Um, and basically, in ASAP, we try to to have a very robust pipeline and also to guide the users as much as we can. Um, and we thought that having this trajectory thing was really, really not uh, easy to do. Uh, so we did not keep it. So we at some point, we stopped it. Uh, at first, we had the uh, monocle uh, trajectory, monocle 3, I think we went to. Um, so we had monocle 1, 2, and 3. And then after the three, we, we stopped. Uh, but yeah, for now, we didn't really have many complaints about that from our user base. Uh, but if if we have, then probably we will uh, implement it again. Can you use the evidence function for model plans? Yes. Yes, so th that the the annotation basically works for any, uh, any um, any any organism, even non-model organism, because we use the Uberon uh, by default, uh, and we also use some some ontologies that are uh, species specific. So, for example, if you work with human data, you have like 
tons of ontology uh, for cell types, for uh, development stage and stuff like that. Uh, but if you work with non-model organism, usually you have Uberon, which is the most, I would say, generic one. So of course it's not perfect, but of course we are dependent on the existing ontologies. So we cannot create new ontologies. So if you work with, I don't know, cow data, uh, then if there is no ontology that describes the specific cell types that exist in cow, then we will not have it. So there will be only the generic cell types that you can find in, in Uberon. But for plants, I, I think we, we have some. So I don't know if for our Arabidopsis we we have. Um, yeah, it depends if it's in Uberon, I guess, or not. I'm not sure for plants, actually. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, something to consider. I don't know if you know any ontology for plants. If you do, then uh, I can. You can upload your own, yeah. You can upload your own uh, gene sets. Yeah, there's a, a, a I'd say it's in the add metadata part. You can upload the uh, gene sets as well. So you can upload your own if you want to, to, to annotate it. But I, I would recommend actually, if you have some that are not present and you think they would be important because you're an expert in the field that uh, we don't know about, because we, of course we don't know everything. And in the lab, mainly we work with a model organism. Uh, we also work with mosquito, but mosquito is very, very similar actually to uh, Drosophila. So we can use the Drosophila ontology for mosquitoes. It works pretty well. Um, but uh, for other like plants and other stuff, if it's missing, uh, please don't hesitate to tell us again with the feedback button and we, we can uh, try to, to integrate them. It's not too hard actually for us to integrate a new ontology if it exists, uh, so it takes maybe like half a day of work so if you have one you know it's the best one for a specific species and we don't have it then please tell us and then we will just add it you probably mentioned it's special to compare conditions that control disease how would one do that yeah so if you have that, then the, the thing you need to do is, as I showed before, you need to create, um, uh, let's go back to the projects. So if I'm in the project view, you go to the metadata, import metadata, and here you can submit, um, um, you can submit a new metadata. So basically you can say, okay, these cells are of this uh, condition, and uh, you do like a two column kind of thing. Uh, or you just you just uh, uh, put it as a as a matrix format like that. Uh, you can copy paste it directly. You can upload a, a CSV file that you would have on on the side, um, and then you upload this. It will be added as a metadata within the uh, the ASAP object, and then you will be able to see it everywhere. So you will be able to to plot so color your visualization with the metadata that you've just created if you want to see the the difference between the two cells or the two conditions. Um, so in the case of disease versus control, that if you create this metadata with annotating which cells are disease, which cells are controlled, um, then you can add it. And, and then afterwards, you will be able to visualize it. And then you will also be able to do differential expression between the two conditions, uh, anything you want to do. Yeah, it, it, since it will be uh, included, then you will be able to, to run it. Then a question from Leonor. I don't know much about the scope of ontology. We work with mouse. Do you assume the most that the most Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So, so for the model organisms, usually uh, we have we we have both the generic and the specific ontologies. Uh, so like for the fly cell atlas, we have the FBBT from Flybase, um, which is a very very specific ontology for Drosophila. Uh, for human cell atlas, we have the uh, the HCA, so human cell atlas, uh, the Uberon, uh, the CL, which is also specific for cell types, and similarly for mouse. So for the model organism, usually we have a lot of ontologies. So it's good to see the list. Yeah, ah, yeah, the list. Where is it? The list? Ah, yeah, yeah. In info, you can see the list of ontologies here. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, Uberon, the classic one. But we also, for human, we also have these two extra ones. So for developmental stage and for uh, the, the one from the human cell atlas. For flies, we, we also have the one from FBBT. And uh, the cell ontology, it works for human only or, or for mass as well? I don't remember. 
Uh, so the, and then you have this it's one as well. One. Yeah, it's a generic one, I think. Uh, so yeah, you have all this available ontology to to do the annotation. But of course, as I said before, if you feel that one is missing and you know one uh, that we could use for another non-model species or even model species, actually, uh, please tell us. Uh, we we also work currently. We work with the uh, David Osumi Sutherland. Uh, which is like one of the experts in ontologies. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are also actively looking for uh, better ontology. We are also submitting new terms, uh, especially BG. The BG group is submitting a lot of new terms in uh, these ontologies uh, to try to really map to the uh, most up-to-date database. So yeah, we are also collaborating with these groups. Uh, so we try to do our best. Of course, it's a very rapidly evolving field. So sometimes we may lack a bit behind. So please tell us if you see any any inconsistencies. And uh, and uh, this is stuff that we have already from our user base. Uh, some people uh, send feedbacks and tell us, oh, well, that's we and all that's missing. And then we we discuss and then we we can uh, uh, afterwards go back to the ontology guys and submit a new request for a new term or stuff like that. Yeah. 